we don't subscribe to the oft-quoted phrase of Jordan Peterson that there is a crisis of masculinity, we may accept that young men live lives in an era where their roles and responsibilities remain subject to intense scrutiny. Liberal society endorses a particular type of man, a new man, domesticated and refined, sensitive and progressive. Conservative criticism seeks to return, or at least how they see it, to a man more in tune with his biological yearnings. The need to be strong and unperturbed by any woolly notions of emotional intelligence. A young Muslim male living this experience is often also confused by the messages coming from Muslim quarters. You can find contemporary Islamic commentary that would back up both liberal and conservative narratives, all looking to paint a type of man in tune with modernity or suited to a time where, as the phrase goes, men knew how to be men. My guest today, Amin, from the Popular Mind Heist podcast, is a young man trying to make sense of this world. Intuitively, he felt both narratives were missing something, and that is the role of revelation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not leave men or women to their base impulses, because without direction, human beings are destined to lead unfulfilled lives. Amin set off on a journey to discover what Islam expects from a man and in his own words found conclusions that challenge his own perceptions. He is in the process of putting his thoughts down on paper and is currently writing a book on the subject and I caught up with him last week to discuss the project and his findings. Rabbi Amin, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome to the Thinking Muslim podcast. I must say it's really a pleasure and an honour to have you on my show this week. Uh, many members of my family, especially the younger members, are all looking forward to your interview. They follow your Mind Highs podcast quite closely and alhamdulillah, uh, they really appreciate the work you're doing. Waalaikum salam wa barakatuh. Jazakallah khairan for having me. And, uh, you know, uh, it's it's an honor to be on a, a podcast with, uh, <laughs> I feel like all your guests are much uh, higher in stature than me, uh, mashallah. So, uh, I'm, I'm going to try my best here to, to bring something of substance. Um, and uh, yeah, just thanks for having me. Uh, I think the podcast is good. The programs you're putting out are good, uh, what I've seen so far. And uh, may Allah put barakah in it. I mean, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really make this conversation uh, fruitful and uh, bring some clarity really to this subject of uh, young males and masculinity and what it means to be a man in the modern world, in the modern era. I'm interested to understand more about your findings, but before we get to that, um, I would like to really understand your motivations. What led you to write this book on Muslim masculinity or masculinity according to the Islamic perspective? Yeah, so it's a good place to start, good question. Um, so I think over the, there's, I guess there's like three main reasons, okay? So the first is that since about, I don't know, age 20, I've always been into, you know, just uh, developing myself, always learning, always developing, uh, looking at, I don't know, my psychology or improving my general behaviors and habits and stuff like that. So I, like age 20 or 21, uh, I remember I attended, I think it was a, a webinar by Productive Muslim. So I was into productivity. I I've been through all the Tony Robbins and the Brian Tracy and all that. So I've generally been into this, right? And this topic of, of uh, what I, I guess I'm calling it the Islamic model for masculinity, right? This, I think, is a vehicle for men to improve themselves. So ultimately, I see this topic as one of uh, personal development uh, and not necessarily one of like Islamic... Um, kind of shar'i or uh, fiqhi knowledge per se, but it's a way that Muslim, Muslim, Muslim men can develop themselves, uh, but that instead of using the, the tools and the worldview that are given to them uh, elsewhere from, from other, other places, they're actually going straight to the source, uh, which is you know, the Qur'an, the Sunnah, the scholars uh, of our religion, um, to help them d develop themselves and improve themselves. And, and no doubt uh, Islam encourages us constantly to improve ourselves anyway, in men or women, right? So that's like the first reason. Um, the second reason was, honestly, uh, I used to be on Twitter, you know, it's been a few years since I left Twitter now, and um, I came up across, uh, I came across a lot of tweets that made me feel uncomfortable, right? These tweets usually were by 
you could say, feminist-leaning uh, Muslim women, okay? And the contents of their tweets might uh, make me feel uncomfortable. They might have made me, you know, want to, you know, have a knee-jerk reaction and kind of maybe argue with them, right? Uh, I think for the most part, I kind of restrain myself, but um, I, it made me really reflect on, okay, I'm uncomfortable with what they're saying, but why am I uncomfortable, right? Like, how can I, if, if what I think is right and what they think is wrong, I need to have substance in my response to that, right? How would I respond to that? So that kind of taught me to uh, restrain myself and actually eventually just leave Twitter. Um, but it made me think still like, People are confused about, you know, the, the, the whole area of gender roles, for example. Should there be gender roles? Uh, this is a big question uh, amongst Muslims. I think in the non-Muslims in the West, it's kind of a foregone conclusion, right? But um, for Muslims, there's still a lot of uh, questions around this. So, you know, let me, let me actually try to form a, a good answer to this. Let's bring substance. And it might not be um, adequate for those who are uh not fully on the quran and sunnah train if you like in terms of like we'll just take this and, and roll with it um so it might not be adequate for them but for those who really do want to follow and they want to take their world view from islam and what allah is giving us in terms of the best way to live then inshallah it will be something of substance and it will help them understand you know ultimately it's like their role in life and their role in society right so i think it's really important um and and ultimately it's just my annoyance that uh, I'm uncomfortable with these ideas I'm hearing, but it's like, okay, if you're serious, you need to find a way to respond to it, right, with, with substance. Uh, and then the third reason is, ultimately, um, inshallah, you know, I think um, most Muslims I speak to, they have a goal of improving the state of the ummah, right? And uh, ultimately, I think the change happens uh, bottom up, and I think the bottom would be the Muslim family. Uh, and, you know, uh, we, we see here of many problems uh, between Muslims, whether it's, you know, siblings, parents, uh, husband and wife, children, this and that. So uh, this is maybe is my contribution to helping to mend the issues we have amongst the families, because I truly, truly believe that if uh, we have strong families, uh, that kind of will solve 80 percent of the issues, inshallah. That's really interesting. I want to pick up on the third point you, you mentioned as the reason yeah. why... You, you as as to why you want to address the subject of masculinity i mean often i completely agree mm. with you but the muslim family is it has to be resolved and and not enough attention is placed or on the muslim family and how it can operate today mm -hmm. um however uh, most prescriptions so far tend to sort of pick up on parenting and and I don't know, the role of the wife, um, maybe even the role of the husband and wife, right, as a, as a yeah. unit. Very few people mm -hmm. have picked up on uh, the topic that you're covering, which is uh, masculinity. And, and is there an Islamic conception of masculinity? Uh, why mm -hmm. do you see masculinity to be at the root, or, or do you, but why do you see it to be at the root mm -hmm. of a good, healthy family? Mm -hmm. um, I, I can't say it's like the number one uh, way to, to fix it, right? I think it's very significant though, okay? Uh, there are other factors, right? There is the, for example, ultimately I think each person needs to take responsibility for the problems they're causing in the world. Like, let's be real, you know, uh, I'm probably causing problems right now for, I don't know, for my, uh, my parents or my... Uh, children whatever it is or my neighbors right we're all causing whether it's small problems or large problems uh, for our families and for the society at large right with some little things we're doing here and there um, and so i think everyone needs to take responsibility for the good and the bad that they do and ultimately it's on your it's on yourself to um to be better better yourself and that will help better the world right so very very much bottom up approach uh, and because i'm a man because i got interested in this topic um i i just applied it there so i said okay if if muslim families are going to change and i'm a muslim man i need to take it upon myself to a improve myself and b that will hopefully uh, trickle down or whatever you want to call it uh onto my family right onto my wife onto my children and then that will then uh help my children's friends and my wife's friends and this and that so uh, it's it's the approach of taking putting all the responsibility on yourself uh, ultimately to uh, improve things right and being a man 
and feeling like I guess it's a top, it's, it's an audience that I would like to address. Uh, I'm telling myself and, and anyone who would you know read the book eventually that it's it's all on you. You know, that's all you should be focusing on is what you're doing, right or wrong, and improving it. To what extent do you subscribe to the notion? Uh, I think put forward by people like Jordan Peterson that there is a crisis of masculinity, and and males no longer uh, have a place in this new world, and uh, as a result, many of the problems we face in families and wider society stem from this basic crisis of identity uh, that that most males feel. Yeah, um, you know Jordan Peterson. I, I think his some of what I've heard from him in terms of uh, psychology is very, very interesting. Um, in terms of the general idea of there being a, a crisis of masculinity, um, I, I do agree with that. Um, obviously, crisis is maybe dramatic, but yes, it's a, it's a big problem, right? And I, I really do believe it, it affects uh, the family dynamics, etc. Um, where, where does that come from? Why is that the case? Um, Wow, uh, there's the so many uh, reasons, right? Um, but I think, for example, uh, on a technology point of view, from a technology point of view, since the Industrial Revolution, the society has lost um, the need for a lot, for a lot of, of men, in a way, right? So before, uh, just on a very basic level, physical labor was more important before, right? Now it's less important. We have robots to do stuff, right? So just on a very basic level, you can see how one of the main uh, traits or things that men brought to the table is now lo now lo no longer needed it's done by uh, robots for example it's done by factories machines etc so uh, we can take that and we can expand expand it you know further and further for example now we don't need men who are ready to go and defend the country because we have a professional army you know we don't need men to sort out uh, I don't know, brawls in the street and, and correct people because we've got professional police now, right? So um, a lot of the uh, roles that men played, uh, the important roles men played, um, they're no longer important, right? On top of that, we have, uh, you know, certain things like the, the feminist mu movement, which ultimately, you know, although the feminist movement is supposed to focus on, uh, you know, the role of women in society, it really is trying to dictate the role of men as well, because as you give women uh, certain new roles, uh, that often leads to taking away uh, men's roles. And um, it also tries to add roles to men that they didn't have before, right? So, you know, technologies change a lot of things, the, the, the shape of the economies change a lot of things, globalizations change a lot of things. Um, and a, a big one actually is the increased involvement of government in our lives, right? It, what that does is it takes a lot of um, responsibility off men and it says no the government's going to take care of this now right so again it's taking responsibility away from men and personally what i found and what i really think is men thrive on responsibility right so a man might not uh take initiative to take on a responsibility for himself but when it's burdened on him that's when he rises to the challenge and so if we have a a, a state where the government is taking care of a lot of the you know burdens on society then uh i think you know the kind of cliche that we hear of happens where you know men are sitting on benefits uh, watching tv or playing video games you know i mean jordan peterson argues that there is a an innate disposition mm. uh, or sense of manhood uh, that modern yeah. society tends to corrupt or tends to undermine and so i think he calls it the emasculation yeah. of a man right so a, a man no longer mm -hmm. Uh, acts and behaves as uh, for, for thousands of years men did act and did behave because of uh, modern mm -hmm. society and he blames that on you know as you said the feminist movement and, and sort of a cause for equality and, and various other things now I wonder whether mm -hmm. from an Islamic perspective there is something there is some correctness to what it say or what he's saying um, uh, mm -hmm. we know that there is a, a concept called fitra and, and all human beings have this natural disposition i suppose what i'm asking is yeah. do you think there is something uh, there is a masculine disposition or a masculine fitra it's, it's very interesting to, to think about that um in terms of fitra I, i'm not right quite comfortable talking in terms of fitra because i feel that's like got its own shari definition right but if you talk about an innate sense of uh, manhood or uh, natural masculine traits then yes i think that's uh, you know there's no doubt about that 
uh, it's really hard to argue with that when you you just look at uh, look at nature right so biology wise it's clear there is the uh, there are masculine traits and the feminine traits yes uh, just on a biology level right then when you look on the psychology level again it's clear right there's a there's a really good book by dr leonard sachs uh, it's called why gender matters and there you can really uh, you know f- fully based on uh, research and the the psychology and even the physiology of the brain how men and w- uh, men and women or girls and boys are going to be different right so biology wise very clear that there there's a difference between men and women and therefore men are going to have specific innate traits psychology wise again very clear uh, because how can you expect that men and women have completely different uh, hormones uh, running through their body uh, and their brain is operating a different way and then the behaviors are not going to be different or the attitudes or the ways of thinking are not going to be different of course they're going to be uh, different right um, and so if we even if we put society aside it's, it's hard to believe that a woman wouldn't have different uh, behaviors attitudes roles than a man right um, and then when we look across time and culture now notice i haven't even got to uh, what Allah is saying yeah, right? Because all this is very uh, self-evident, I think, right? If you just observe. Um, when you look at, uh, also, this is maybe the strongest point, is when you look across time and culture, you see common trends. And for me, that means that is, that is natural, okay? So if we look across, um, let's say, we look across uh, culture and time, okay? So uh, 500 years ago and 2,000 years ago, uh, and then look in the Middle East, look in Europe, look in China, yeah? You're going to find that uh, people are battling each other, okay? So we can say that's natural. Um, we're going to find people, uh, you know, you always find a, a group of people who are greedy, okay? So that, you, we can say that's natural, right? Equally, we find that across uh, cultures and times, there were traits that men held, right? Now, were there exceptions in different cultures? Yes, but we're talking about uh, the general rule, right? And uh, did you have differences in cultures in, in the role that men played? Yes, but there's also a common thread. And that common thread is, is what we could call uh, natural, you know, masculine disposition. That, that's really interesting. So in, in your mind that, you know, we tend to today, because of all, for all the reasons that you've mentioned, you know, the shifts in, in society, we, we tend to uh, dr- push against those natural uh, dispositions or inclinations that that uh, men have, and and as a result, uh, there is this vacuum and there is a problem in the lives of men. I mean, I I had a startling statistic, and I c- I can never remember statistics offhand, but it's 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 about mm-hmm. the number one killer of of um, men in America is suicide, and and mm. and, and and large part of that uh, of of those suicides or the reasons behind the suicides is is that men feel that uh, they can no longer look after their families due to debt or out of work or yeah. and and i suppose that feeds into uh, your thesis your argument that um, men no longer have a a place in this in this new world mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. when we look at the muslim male um, and 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 I, I I appreciate this is going to be a caricature and it, it's very general generalized. But mm. uh, you mentioned Twitter earlier on. But when we observe the Muslim male, uh, we often find that mm. uh, they do shoot from the hip, and and um, you know a lot of the angst that that is created on on platforms like Twitter and Facebook. Uh, you know for sure, you know there are people out there, you know females out there who. Uh, who, yeah. who say things in order to solicit certain types of responses. But uh, more often than not, young men are responsible for the anger and frustrations and and, mm. those, and the sometimes quite bad behavior that exists on, on, uh, on uh, uh, these social platforms. So uh, I suppose if I was to turn this into a question, my, my question is, you know, is it always a good thing to rely on these innate qualities, especially when these innate qualities often... Uh, lead to quite bad results yes uh, so i i agree it's not it's not especially for a muslim uh, of course like maybe uh, another someone coming from another worldview would argue you know whatever is natural is natural and just let it play out or whatever survival of the fittest whatever but uh, no as muslims we say uh, no you don't just follow what uh, whatever comes to you um whatever your desire is you go and uh, achieve that or go out to get that no we have guidelines uh, which make us 
A, in line with nature, right? Because obviously Allah created everything. Allah created the nature that, that men have and the women have. Uh, but then B, is that the, the, the nature needs to be guided by uh, the rules that Allah laid down for us and the guidance that Allah laid uh, down for us, okay? So, um, yeah, it should, it should be guided by that. So that's kind of what this, the book is trying to achieve, which is um, not only what makes a man uh, masculine, I actually initially started with the idea of, okay, let's explore this. What makes a man uh, masculine? And I think uh, there are books uh, from non-Muslims who kind of deal with that, like um, The Way of Men, okay, or, or just Way of Men. Um, that is a book, uh, obviously it's not coming from a Muslim worldview, but uh, he's kind of pretty successfully, um, he successfully laid out the, uh, the traits of, of men. Uh, maybe some we would disagree with, some we would agree with, right? But... Um, uh, that that's like what what makes someone masculine but what we want to find out that's why i decided i don't want to find out what makes a man uh, masculine i want to find out what makes a good muslim man okay what is the model for for masculinity that allah wants or allah will be pleased with that allah has given us what's the role that allah has given men okay and it doesn't just come down to uh, what allah has made an obligation on men no it's further than that what is the optimal man what role does he play what uh, voluntary acts does he take up upon himself you know um so yeah definitely it's not about uh, for example men are uh, let's say more aggressive than women definitely to 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 compare with women men are going to be more aggressive right now you could say that that is going to make men uh, into whatever rapists for example right uh, men that is going to make men into rapists if they don't like completely control it and if they they don't have any moral compass that that might be the way they go down but when we combine the aggression with the guidelines allah has given us what you find is a courageous man looking to defend his family defend his nation even defend a stranger when it comes to oppression right to stand up against oppression right and that is an example of the unique role that Allah has given us, right? So we have the aggression naturally. We have the testosterone, which allows us to prepare our body really to fight, if you like. Um, we have maybe the courage that comes along with that, the risk taking that comes along with that. Uh, and then Allah tells us to guide it in the correct direction. OK, so you've got the aggression. Don't use it against women. You know, you fool. Don't use it against, uh, you know, the, the weak. Use it against oppressors. Use it against uh, when there's injustice being done, you know, and really use it against yourself when you're not behaving correctly. Have that self-control. So what role does, does revelation then play in, in refashioning or fashioning the man? And, and uh, I, I note that in, in the piece I read from you, you, you suggested that you discovered a number of interesting conclusions as a result of your research, which, re which tested even mm. your original understanding or challenge your, your original worldview about masculinity. Can you share with us yeah. some of the findings mm -hmm. uh, that you, you put into your yeah, book? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So uh, the book is, you know, still not completely finalized, but up until now, I mean, there's definitely been some clear conclusion in terms of things that are recommended for men to take on in terms of traits, right? Um, and uh, when it comes to looking at the revelation, obviously I looked at, I went to the Quran, I went to the tafsir of the Quran, I went to the hadith, and not just the what the Prophet like told us to do, but like the stories behind it, right, and the context behind those hadith, and then you can look at the explanations of hadith and what scholars have said, etc., right? Um, so a few interesting things. I think the number one thing that came up uh, time and time again was self-control, okay? Um, and how does this manifest in terms of the revelation and stuff? Well, if you think about one of the uh, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, you know, I don't leave a bigger, bigger trial for uh, the men than, than women, okay? And so when it comes to lowering the gaze, this is, uh, this is a daily, it depends where you live, but it could be a daily uh, exercise in self-control, okay? And we have the great uh, example of Yusuf ﷺ, where, you know, he was uh, presented with that, you know, temptation and he, he rejected, he refused it, right? So he had that self-control. Um, that, that's a big one. Uh, another one is again within self-control. It's, uh, for example, the Prophet Sallam he said uh, to a man. Again, a man came to him, and the Prophet Sallam he he gave us uh, sometimes general advice, but sometimes it's very interesting to look into the context of when he was saying uh, what, right? And so uh, when he said uh, a man came to him, said, "Give me advice," he said, "La taghab," don't 
Uh, don't get angry. Don't be angry. Okay. Again, that's self-control. And it's, it's, it applies to women as well, right? But it's obvious that men are the ones who struggle with this more often than women, right? So control your anger. Another one when uh, a lot of the companions, they were uh, wrestling and they're trying to, you know, competing and seeing, you know, it's a classical uh, thing that men like to do to compete and see, okay, where are you in the hierarchy kind of thing. They're wrestling with each other. And the Prophet he, he came and he said, uh, you know, why are you wrestling? Of course, he knows why they're wrestling. You know, the, the obvious answer is, you know, to see who's the strongest. And that's out of that context is a very a context that's very male driven, if you like. You know, there's men and they're wrestling. And then what does he say to them? Uh, he said, uh, So the, the strong one is not the one who can uh, wrestle. It's the one who can control himself when he gets angry. OK, so he's kind of defining for them uh, one of the big traits that throughout history we've, you know, and until today, the macho man, the strong man. And it's something still important. You know, I would even say it's, it's part of the revelation that a man should be strong. But the Prophet Sallam is actually indicating what's a bit more important than that is the self-control. Right. So self-control was uh, was a big one that I found. Um, leadership is another one. So uh, leadership uh, I, I feel like it goes into two categories. So there's leadership in the home, right? So obviously uh, we have the hadith of Prophet Sallam where he said, you know, everyone is, every one of you is a shepherd and every one of you will, will be asked about their flock, right? And he mentioned that the man is the shepherd of, of his home, of you know, his wife and children and his home. And so again, a man is a leader whether he likes it or not. So he must take on and um, take on the traits of a, of a good leader. And again, how do you define leadership? I mean, I honestly think some of the, you know, the corporate kind of leadership books, they might be good. But the Prophet and the Sahaba also laid out really good uh, models for, for leadership, uh, especially when it comes to uh, humility and emotional intelligence when dealing with people. Right. So leadership in the home, that's a big one. And uh, obviously we know that Allah made Allah made the man the leader of the home. Uh, and there's so much uh, explanation of that uh, area. But. Um, ultimately, a man must lead in the home. And often what, uh, and that leads me to like another trait, which is actually, this this stuck out to me so much that I thought this is actually a key trait. And it's actually being gentle and being lenient with women, right? Rather than what you kind of alluded to about what happens on Twitter. And I went, uh, that's actually exactly what I thought of when, uh, when I gathered all these kind of hadith about being uh, careful and being gentle with women is that's exactly opposite sometimes what we see on twitter where the the young men on twitter are looking to uh fight with women almost argue with women on a public platform and uh make fun of them laugh at them this is absolutely the opposite um of of the model that prophet Sallam kind of came with right so leadership in the home uh gentleness with women uh being being uh, careful with women being uh Honestly, it's, you could just say uh, chivalrous, isn't it? Uh, what we know to be chivalrous uh, with women. Um, so those are, those are a few. Then we have leadership outside the home, right? And that is when, so you, it, it's easy to be the big man sometimes. It's easy to be the big man at home when, you know, your wife is there, you're providing for your wife, your children, they're younger than you, and you're telling, you're ordering people around, right? So that's sometimes a cliche of what some men are like, where they're just, you know, big man in the house, as soon as they walk out and there are other men in the street, oh, now he's, now he's the kitten, right? Whereas, you know, it should be the opposite. He's a kitten in the home. He's a lion outside. So being a, a leader outside the home, um, a lot of that, uh, interestingly, for example, in the Quran, Allah mentions multiple times uh, the words, وَجَاءَ مِنْ أَقْسَ الْمَدِينَةِ رَجُلٌ يَسْعَى And uh, the translation of that is approximately, and from the far side of the city, a man came uh, rushing or came striving forward, right? And what, what happens in these cases is that a man is coming and he's putting in a lot of effort from Aqsa al-Madina. He's coming from the far end of the city to, to do something on a mission, right? And also it says, yes, ah, he's really putting uh, effort and uh, energy in, in getting there. You could say he's running, he's rushing to this scene. And what he's rushing towards is actually standing up for the truth in the face of uh, an incorrect status quo. 
Okay, and like you know, big example of this would be in Surah Al Yasin, Surah Yasin, when uh, the man came and he said, "Attabi al Mursalun, follow the the uh, messengers." Right. So imagine a big mob who rejecting the messengers, and this man comes from the other side and he tells them he stands up in front of the whole mob and he says, "Follow the prophets. Yeah, follow the messengers." Right. And uh, obviously, what we know from the surah is that he was actually martyred after that. Right. So he put his life on the line, and that is leadership. It's not saying. Who is going to, like, oh, the prophets are here, they'll deal with it, right? No, it's taking initiative. It's taking initiative without being asked, okay? And this is something that uh, I think uh, a, big, a big thing us Muslim men need to realize is that uh, we thrive on challenges. We thrive on responsibility. Uh, but often the world will not put responsibility on you. You need to take it on yourself. You need to take it on for yourself. And just from my own observations, like, Women actually are very, take a lot of initiative, right? They'll, they'll get up and they'll do stuff, right? Especially if men are not filling that role, they'll go fill the role, right? And so then you get men complaining about uh, how women are taking men's roles. Well, often it's because you're not filling the role yourself, right? So we need to take on that role. And in, interestingly, there is the hadith uh, where the Prophet ﷺ said, if a woman just does a few things, right? Obey her husband, pray her prayers, uh, fast her Ramadan, uh, then she will enter Jannah from whatever gate she pleases, right? This is a very high status, right? Um, the, the fact of the matter is a man doesn't have an equivalent hadith for how he can enter Jannah from any gate he pleases. And even if he was to enter a, uh, any gate he pleases, he, you, we can imagine that he would have to actually go out and take on responsibility, right? Rather than just the few things that Prophet ﷺ listed for him. So therefore, you know, generally something I've really uh, come to terms with is that us men, we actually have to go out and take on the responsibility. No one's going to ask you to do it. You know, no one's going to, you know, if you're in the street and, you know, like we hear about uh, Muslim women being attacked in, in London or in America, or whatever, and no one is going to point at you, Mr. Muslim man, and say, that's your sister, go protect her. No, you need to take it upon yourself. You know, maybe you're not visibly a Muslim. No one's going to know about, but Allah will know. Right. And this is your responsibility. So you have to take it on and you have to, you know, go for it. Right. So that's like leadership outside uh, the house. And another one, which final one I'll just share with you is actually interesting because, like I said, it, it did change my perspective on uh, how a man should be. And this one is like being emotionally vulnerable, but in the right context. And, and you could say without losing your self-control. So we, we actually find that uh the the prophets and uh, the sahaba they, they're actually quite emotional people okay uh, and so I, I don't think that men don't cry that's too black and white but also the whole metrosexual man who's just so open about his feelings and he just lets it all out uh, in any you know any context that's also uh, too black and white I, I i wouldn't say that's kind of in line with the sunnah either what i would say is a middle path here is that you, are, you feel emotion firstly, you know, we have to be clear that men can and, you know, should feel, feel, have strong feelings, right? Now, when they, when they express that and when they don't express that, you should have enough self-control to actually decide when you want to express it and when you don't. Um, so, for example, uh, in the presence of your wife, if you want to be vulnerable uh, about something which actually she's relying on you for, for example, like financial security, uh, if you let out your, your worries about your financial security to her, that's not the right place to do it. But then you can be open and vulnerable with your friends about that because they're not relying on you uh, for that, right? Equally, when uh, Musa was going to uh, Fara'aun with his brother, uh, he, said, he said to Allah, Inna khaf. He said, we are scared. How would he know that they're both scared unless they, they were emotionally open with each other uh, to some level, right? Um, so. You know, these are some of the, you know, five, five big ones I've just kind of uh, put together for you now. So self-control, uh, leadership in the home, uh, gentleness with women, uh, leadership outside the home, standing up against the status quo, and then finally being emo emotionally vulnerable. Um, and, and just uh, you asked also about um, like how it changed my view, right? So my view of things, I suppose, is, is the old school, is the, is the traditional uh, way of seeing things. And that, you know, that's slightly different. It depends where you are in the world and stuff. But, um, for example, you know, what I kind of was used to is, uh, 
men uh, men being served by women in the house to a very very high level in terms of you know men not really lifting a finger now they would work very hard outside the home but once they're in the home they're kind of not doing anything and my just this one example but my view of that really changed when i thought of being a leader and a leader takes initiative right he doesn't uh, ask for his wife to do something he'll go and do it and maybe his wife would have so much respect for him that she uh, and she cares for him she'll say no no i'll do that that's fine but you should t have the initiative you should be proactive and say look i'm not actually in need of anyone to do anything for me um i will i'm happy to do stuff um but if that's you know if that's the role you have then you can do that if you want to volunteer to help me with it or or do that for me then do it but my first kind of reaction is no i'll do it for myself Yes, I believe it was Omar, Omar bin Khattab, when he was Khalifa, right? He dropped something off his, uh, off his horse or camel and uh, someone, his, I think it was actually his slave who was going to pick it up for him. And he refused. He, you know, he said, I'm going to get off my camel. I'm going to pick it up because he said, uh, I believe what he said to the slave, where the slave was like, you know, why wouldn't you uh, do that? He said, are you going to lift my sins on Yom Al-Qiyamah, right? So his attitude was very much one of, independence and doing things for, for yourself. You, you've set up some really interesting research there about uh, the, uh, the role of Muslim men. And, and I suppose that it begs the question, or a couple of questions, in fact. Mm. Firstly, why is it that this narrative is missing in the Muslim community? I mean, surely, uh, you know, the way you, st you, you strung together a lot of these texts, mm. I mean, these texts aren't foreign to, to many of us, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, but maybe we haven't uh, visualize the text in, in the context of manhood. Yeah. We, we took another story from it. So mm. why is it that this uh, development of the Muslim man is missing in our communities? Yeah, I mean, uh, it might be the simple fact that nobody is focused on it. Um, mm. And historically, I think it wasn't an issue, and that's why it wasn't focused on, right? Uh, so, so you wouldn't find any scholarly books on Muslim masculinity, for example? Um, what I have found is books on uh, futua and muru'a, right, which you could translate as chivalry. But, but when I go to those books, what I find is general good character, okay, uh, books uh, on general good character. And I think uh, what, I've, what I've heard is that, uh, especially before, the content, uh, concept of being a good man uh, being a real man it kind of applied to women as well in the sense of uh they have muru'a they they're well mannered person they have great character uh they kind of link that with chivalry um and and it was like a for men and women you could say because when you read these books like uh sulami i think uh abdurrahman sulami he has a, a book uh kitab al futuwa um but when you read it it's not so much only for men that, that's how i would read it at least in 2020 I, I went through it and uh, it's great, of course. It's great for character building, improving your character and how you are with people. But it, I don't think it, it really brought the answers for uh, that a lot of men are asking. You know, what is my role? Um, how do I act when a woman provokes me in this context? And, the, you know, like what maybe <laughs> men are dealing with on Twitter or whatever. Um, what, what should a man do in the home? What shouldn't he do? Uh, this, you know, I believe uh, Sulami, he died in the fourth century Hijri, Rahimahullah. So uh, it was just not an issue at that time. And so I think that's why they, they didn't write about it. Just how, you know, you might not find, you know, a thousand year old books on mortgages, you know. I think in the, because a lot of the time, uh, you know, a lot of the good work works are in Arabic, right? And in the Arab world, I think the whole issue of, you know, feminism and liberalism, it's, I think they're only waking up to it now. Uh, not in the sense that they didn't, they didn't understand it and they didn't understand it was there, but it's just become more of an issue maybe more recently. And so now you're going to find works being done, perhaps. Uh, in the meantime, I'll try, you know, to do what I can. Obviously, I'm sure, you know, real scholars of religion might do a better job than me, but it needs to be done, and so I'm I'm trying my best. I think uh, you know you you have an insight into uh, the the young Muslim male, which I think even many scholars would would probably find very difficult to understand. And so that I think something, and it, and it's more authentic, mm. I would imagine, if it comes from um, someone of mm. your age and someone who, of your experience, especially with that mm. group of people. I'm just trying to understand uh, why in Islamic history, I mean, I, I get your argument and it's a very strong argument that it just mm. wasn't an issue. 
What about the a counter argument to that? And and um and, and that is often put forward by by feminists, and that is that it, it was not an issue because women just had to accept their place in in you know mm-hmm. Islamic history and, and men were these dominant beings and, and they had you know they were exercising their masculinity in a very negative mm-hmm. way for centuries. And it's only since it's only now that uh, the Muslims have had to engage with uh, liberalism and, and feminism and, mm. and so now we're struggling know, with it, yeah. <laughs> now we're struggling with it, right? So it's 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 more you know we're being pushed in. I mean, you're being pushed into mm. writing this book because you know you've you've been found out, right? And we've been found out as the male species for being mm. uh, for. Um, for our failures over the last few centuries. Mm. I mean, you know, that, that is a thought that, that does go through uh, some of our minds. I mean, how, how would you address that? Yeah. Oh, wow. There's so many angles I think we can approach that. I mean, firstly, uh, you know, so the basic argument they might say, right, is that um, me- so men have been uh, dominant over women and mistreating women, you could say, or forcing them into roles that they don't necessarily fit um up until now and it's only now that we have the ability to counter this is that is that it right right yeah. so i mean what does that say then about for example the process that i'm talking about you know the first three generations are the best generations right um and i think some scholars even say that that doesn't just apply to the first three generations it applies to the general concept that uh generations get, are getting worse over time and not better right um and even when you look at the general the the taqwa of the people in the past um how much closer to the fitra even you could say even the non-muslims uh were closer to the fitra and de- uh, therefore you know better people uh, than today uh, and it's important i think to separate between material progress and comfort and quality of life uh, versus uh, moral uh, quality and uh, social uh, cohesion and uh, general uh, you know contentment uh, with life right uh, i think those kind of if, if you could put them into metrics they might be going down while comfort and uh comfort it goes up right so comfort uh, material wealth goes up and those things are going down so um i would argue that uh what as muslims what we're seeking in life we're not seeking comfort per se you know that's a that's a luxury that's a nice to have we're seeking you know closest to allah acceptance from allah and on a dunya level we're seeking you know some level of contentment some level of um safety some level of good relationships with family and with the the, the society around us and therefore surely we would look back in time for that and not today right so that's one argument um the other argument would be um I don't I can't accept personally that women or men or any type of person would be put down for so long and be so uncomfortable in the position that society has forced them into and they don't rebel right at some point maybe you can hold them down for 100 years maybe 200 years but what we know from history is that it's a cycle right people empires fall new empires come up you know no matter how big the empire was uh, Ottoman Empire, British Empire, whatever, um, it, it, you know, it, it crumbles. Um, and so if women were being pushed into this, then I, I can't accept that. Oh, now you're saying now is the revolution after 1,400 years. Now, I, I can't accept that women weren't actually OK with with the way things were, because if they weren't OK and it was that bad, I think they really would this uh, this uh, rebellion or uh, this revolution would have happened after 100 years, 200 years, but not 1,400 years. For me, that indicates there was a certain level of um, contentment with the way things were. And you can uh, even, yeah, let's get out of the bubble of uh, the West and, and 2020, yeah? Um, 50 years ago, uh, women in the West were happier than now, yeah? I think there's a lot of data to show that. Um, and in in more traditional cultures, uh, I think generally women are happier than in the West. So we don't even have to go too far to, to see that we're actually going the wrong way rather than the right way. Wallahu a'lam. No, it's, it's a very good answer. And I was, I was reading today uh, an article uh, that someone submitted uh, from Nigeria. Mm-hmm. Uh, my wife is pr- putting together a book about feminism and, and the engagement and the in- interaction with Muslim women. 
she spoke about she, she's she's written against feminism for some time and and she recently wrote this piece about how Muslim men often push women into feminism. Mm. And it was a very clever piece. I mean, she wasn't uh, condoning feminism, but her argument was that through our actions and through uh, the injustices yeah. and the absence of Islamic revelation and Islamic rights, or at least even if one uh, accepts those rights, one doesn't actually abide mm -hmm. by them. Um, uh, Muslim women can only really find solace in uh, in uh, feminism and in, in Western rights because because they go to the imam and they go to the community leaders and, and nothing seems to yeah. change, right? To what extent do you, do you buy that argument and, and do you think there is something substantial here that needs to be addressed? Yeah, I buy it fully. Uh, full price, no discount. Um, uh, I think, uh, like I said at the beginning, I'm happy to take on responsibility and uh, admit failures. Um, and I can't admit for failures of other men because it's, it's everyone's you know, responsible for themselves. But uh, with the book, what, you know, one of the messages I'm trying to send with the book is let's admit, you know, as, as men, we kind of do have some failures. So let's admit it and let's be leaders. Let's take responsibility and take initiative. So before, you know, before we uh, lose our women to feminism, if you want to word it that way, uh, instead of it having to go get to that let's sort ourselves out let's be the best men we could be according to the islamic model of masculinity and then if the women still want to go to feminism then you know i don't know what can we do about that but i what i would argue is if we are men according to the sunnah way of being a man then uh the opposite would happen to be honest um yeah so uh, I, i'm happy to say that uh, sometimes we we really fall short, and we we can we can actually make many arguments and excuses for ourselves. We can say, you know, the uh, the size of the government and how much they're involved in our lives, and the fact, for example, the fact that you can get benefits right in the UK, you're not working. Um, you could say, oh, that really doesn't incentivize me to work. You could say that, and therefore, um, you know, it, you would say I'm not being a proper man and not working hard and this and that. Um, so you can make excuses, but forget excuses let's just take on responsibility let's be, be the best we can be and ultimately um you know you got to take those excuses to allah as well so let's be honest with ourselves uh, what has led to uh this absence of islamic thinking in, in a variety of areas and you know you're focusing on the role of a muslim man but it's a very basic uh a very basic problem that um that we face, um, but but if we expand it in every area, right? When it comes to marriage, when it comes to uh, living in a community, when it comes to trade or whatever it may be, there is a, a palpable mm. absence of the Islamic thought, right? And and we don't mm -hmm. really have details. We may have you know a hadith here, or we may have some uh, notion of what is right uh, from uh, from uh, you know the wider community or from imams, but we don't really have specifics and. I suppose a task you're trying to do is, is try. To, you're trying to flesh out the specifics so that a, a Muslim is rightly guided rather than just generally guided, and, and you know, and and uh, as a result, uh, that general guidance leads them to error. I, I'm trying to understand why mm -hmm. is it that our communities, and you know, in the Muslim world, I mean, there's, it's no different, right? If you go to Pakistan or Nigeria, but also in the West, why is it that our communities? Uh, I have a there is a failure to uh, explain the de the depth and the details of Islam in a way that you want to do with this book. Yeah, that's a that's a big big question, Jalal. Um, but like like you know, I, I mean, I mean, like you and I. I mean, I'm older than you, right? But when I was, um, you know, alhamdulillah, my parents uh, are uh, you know fantastic parents, and they've got you know they've given me so much. But what is clear is you know they did not inherit from their parents um and and you know a a a, uh, a detailed islamic culture to deal with these these issues right so something down the line went wrong um you know in in a whole array of areas and we're focusing on men but because ideally i would imagine and i'm sure you do this you'll be explaining to your children what it means to be a man from an islamic context at a very early age and i suppose that's the islamic method right we're not going to rely on a state to tell us how to 
how to be a man. We're going to rely on our family and our parents and yeah. our fathers to yeah. do that, yeah. right? Yeah. So what went wrong in, in yeah. that chain? Mm. Why is it that we've ended up where we are? Yeah. Maybe we maybe we haven't. Maybe nothing went wrong, right? So I'll explain. Um, let's say, you know, if you're, if you're from Pakistan originally, um, your parents, let's say, were born in Pakistan, their grandparents were born in Pakistan. They had a general... Or maybe I'm wrong here, but they had, my, they had a general Islamic culture, okay? So generally, the way they lived their lives was according to Islam. W- were they educated in Islam? Maybe not, you know? Could they quote hadith or any... No, maybe they couldn't, right? Uh, but uh, this is what I believe. I don't believe that we need to expect every individual to have a good Islamic education, to have a good society. I believe that we just need to have the culture and the norms of the culture and the society to make sure everyone's in line with the Islamic values, right? And so I think in the past, that's how things were kind of uh, maybe better than now, at least values-wise, is because um, people actually didn't need to be educated on how to be good. It was just a general uh, norm of the culture is that this is good and this is bad, right? Now, what has happened, I think we're in a transition phase now, where now there is questions about what is good and what is bad. Okay, and now that's when we need, I guess we need to expect every individual get educated on what's good and bad because the culture is not so clear. The, the culture is not homogenous anymore. There's globalization. There's, you know, even if you're in Mauritania now, you're being exposed to YouTube, right? And so the, the mind is actually being uh, filled with so many different ideas and, and sometimes clashing ideologies. So now it's like, okay. I guess we we have to react, right? Ideally, we would have educated everyone. I'm not saying that's not ideal, but I'm saying it's probably a big ask. If 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 you if you ask me, uh, and, and I'm not a historian, but I would guess that the average Muslim in the past did not have an amazing Islamic education, but the culture that they lived in led them to living generally moral lives in line with Islamic values. Um, but now, because we're in the transition phase, because we're we're adapting to the new. Uh, world where there's globalization, there's uh, let's let's be real, you know, attacks on our values. Now we we kind of do need to expect everyone to be educated to to an extent to combat that. That really moves on to allows me to talk about culture and and the impact um, Western culture, if you like, or liberal culture has had on uh, the young Muslim male. Uh, because I mean, again, you know, I I haven't studied this and I haven't, but anecdotally, I, I would imagine. Uh, we're all products of our culture, right? We, we may claim we're not, but we're, we all are impacted by foreign cultures or by cultures of others. But but I would imagine young people today are ex- are extremely impacted by uh, the, you know liberal culture, and and as you said, you know it, it's just through their smartphone mm-hmm. and what they watch uh, and what they are consumed with. I mean. I would imagine you agree with that. And if, if that is the case, how is it that we can reverse something so intimate? I mean, never has there been a civilization that's been able to reach you at every minute of the day like you know, Western liberal culture can. Yeah, yeah. Um, obviously, it's a big question, uh, but I, I have obviously my own ideas around this. I think you you try to actually design or engineer your environment uh, with, with clear intention. Um, so actually on my, on my podcast, Mind Heist, um, I think it was episode 79, I interviewed somebody who he's African American and he was actually working in, uh, in Medina. Okay. In the city of the Prophet Salem. And he left that to, uh, live on a farm in the U S right. Mm-hmm. Because he said that this, uh, lifestyle and this setup is going to be better for, for raising his family and living a more, uh, Islamic life in, in touch with, uh, yeah, the ideal uh, way of living, right? With less distractions, mm-hmm. less uh, fit and et cetera around him, right? So that's an example of really intentionally designing a life around what you want in the end, right? Um, so that's kind of, you could say that's an extreme example where he's like taking it mm-hmm. his whole life and moving it. Um, but maybe I can share, uh, because I can't say I have the, the, the absolute answer on this, but I can share what I do, right? So mm-hmm. I don't have Instagram. I don't have Snapchat. I don't have TikTok. Um, my Facebook usage is limited to 30 minutes a day. My YouTube is limited, again, to uh, 
think it's 90 minutes a day that I do, uh, but that's a maximum, right? It just means I can't go beyond that. And also I've turned off recommended videos. I've turned off the comments on YouTube. And, um, and also I can't use YouTube outside of certain hours of the day, right? So it's rare that I'm even going to be able to use it 90 minutes a day, right? Uh, are, you, are you Jason Bourne? Or <laughs> <laughs> but, but this is a way to uh, engineer your environment. So it's, the temptation actually doesn't even exist anymore because I've removed the even ability to do some of those things that I've just decided intentionally I don't want to do that, right? Um, again, I choose to live in a Muslim country. Um, and I, I, th th this is like some, th the things I've mentioned are ways to uh, avoid uh, media or, you know, these influences impacting you too much, right? It's like, so, uh, it's actually one action that you can do and that you kind of can forget about it after that. You don't have to constantly put effort into it. But then beyond that, in terms of uh, ongoing kind of stuff you can do, what I think is, you know, become, become educate yourself, right? Uh, because Allah loves the strong Muslim. And uh, that includes being mentally strong, being aware of, uh, like, like uh, in the course that you taught, uh, the thinking Muslim is what what are the origins of liberalism? What's the origins of you know the the materialistic uh, society we live in? Where does that actually come from? This will empower you, I think, right? Especially getting to the sources of it. Uh, then history, I think, is is fundamental. Um, again, in making you strong mentally, um, and also it allows you to question the current bubble that we're we're living in, right? So a lot of people. Uh, the, the auto automatic way of thinking is that the way things are now is the way things have always been right and you kind of it's just an automatic bias that we have that we just think this is how it is but obviously that's not true we kind of really do we live in a location bubble a time bubble a class bubble a maybe a race bubble like we live in so many bubbles so history allows you to escape that bubble uh, traveling of course helps uh, and generally i think being in touch with nature and then finally obviously creating our own media is is a way and i don't just mean uh you know the, there's good stuff being done elm feed and this and that um but it's also having media that's not necessarily islamic per se in in an obvious way it's like where where's the muslim national geographic you know where's the muslim like cooking shows or whatever it can be a bit informal right but as long as it's in line with the values it's fine right um so yeah those are like three areas i guess it, intentionally designing your environment uh, trying to develop yourself, your your mind, you know, educating yourself, and then on a proactive thing, like we need to either create our own media or uh, contribute to media. You know, I always try and encourage people to, if you're going to donate money, you know, put ten percent aside or twenty percent aside of whatever you're going to give to something which is more long term. You know, like uh, supporting like institutions, you know, media thing. Like I, I understand there is a urgency of. Uh, uh, of emergencies and food packs and people are starving 100 percent. but just put a little bit aside to actually build the long-term institutions as well in designing um, your environment i mean that, that requires a lot of self-restraint right you know you've got to what i would imagine you know especially in, in today's world young people again I'm, I'm speaking like a like i'm 60 or something but young <laughs> people tend to be uh, tend to have very little self-restraint because yeah. the commercialized world in which they live it is very much about yes. instant gratification so yeah. one would be one would be um you know one would would have to have a lot of self-discipline to to mm. to be able to do that i would imagine mm. well i'll give you an example right so now uh it's seven twenty where i am yeah mm. at 10 o'clock at 10 p.m i won't be able to access youtube Right. There won't be a way for me to access YouTube. I can't do it. Right. right. So I don't I, I'm not there is no restraint. Like I, I just can't do it. Right. So, so what, why is why can't you do that? Oh, because I've actually got a software that blocks it for me. Ah, right. right. And that software, I've actually set it up. Uh, I mean, you can have different layers of how how much you want it to be. So you can't control it anymore. But mm. I've got it set. So I can't control it. Right. Uh, mm. I can't make changes to it. So. Um, you know, people think that's crazy. And I think a lot of people, they like the idea that, no, no, I'm in control. I'm strong enough. But what I always say to them is that there are engineers, software engineers working at Instagram. They get getting, they're so smart and in demand that they're getting paid $300,000 a year and they're working 40 hours a week to keep you on their platform. And you somehow think you're naive enough to think you can resist that. 
You know, they're smart people. It's the full-time job for, for them. For you, it's not a full-time job to resist them and to fight them, right? So that's why I enlist the help of other software engineers to use the software to block it. <laughs> and back to your book, I mean, I can imagine you're going to produce a additional material surrounding your book to publicize it as well as to express some of the ideas in a, in a bite-sized form. Uh, but is there a place to have a, a mentoring course of some sort for mm -hmm. young Muslim men uh, so that uh, you can bring to life some of the ideas in your book and um, mm. uh, explain these ideas uh, to, to them in a, in a more live sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I, I think, Jalal, that uh, a course would be great. Uh, but I think ultimately uh, the difference and the missing link here is because like you, we, you know, we referred to Twitter and Twitter, I don't know, it's a kind of a place where you, you kind of get a, you put your finger on the pulse of uh, young, even, even you could say young religious Muslims in the UK or US, right? And over there you find even the, those who are, have some level of uh, Islamic education, um, they don't have the character to go with it, right? Uh, and I think that is the gap. I think terbiyah is the gap, right? And um, how do you develop terbiyah? You, you just, I really think it's very difficult to develop it online, like through online means. I think you need to get people in a room, in a masjid, in a, in a, in a football pitch. Um, I think that's how it's done. And so, you know, when I look to like raising my son, inshallah, I, that's, that's all I'm thinking. I'm thinking real life stuff. I'm not thinking about teaching him um, the stuff I've taught, uh, I've, I've talked about on this podcast. I'm thinking of just trying to uh, live that, live that model, right, of masculinity. And also just put him in the environment where he can just uh, gain it naturally, where I think, you know, our parents, grandparents, they took it on naturally. Um, you know, uh, if mm. I think of like stuff like uh, Duke of Edinburgh, have you heard of that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's a very like uh, what's the word? I guess it's a it's a softy version of what you know our grandparents were up to as children. Mm -hmm. um, but I think this, uh, as well as you know martial arts, these things uh, is is the terbiyah we need, right? And obviously, when it comes to Islamic education, it's it's very important as well. But the education is is not just knowledge; it's knowledge and action. And you get action through seeing your teacher and your teacher holding you accountable. So we have we need to have more of a murabi system than just a muallim system. You know, we are finding here in the West that uh, things are getting uh, more and more difficult for us to live out our Islamic lives, and um, it's not just the cultural aspects that we've spoken about, but it's more of a sort of political aspects and and the you know the uh, the hatred uh, that our community faces is now quite palpable, especially in some quarters. Uh, in Britain, in, in Europe, you know, in Belgium, we heard our sisters now can't wear hijab at the universities. And Belgium was was held a few years back as a as an example of multiculturalism. So things are changing, and things are changing quite quickly. To what extent is it a fool's errand to think about building long term our communities here in the West? And maybe we should do what what you did, right? And 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 move and and make an intention to move away. And, uh, and move to the Muslim world. I, I appreciate the Muslim world isn't perfect, but at least we're with uh, Muslims and, and, and we're able to, we have some, you know, dare I say, I mean, you know, we, we claim that we have freedom here, but actually I would imagine for a Muslim in UAE or in Qatar or in, in other Muslim countries, there's far more freedom to, to live your Islamic life than there is in, in these countries. Yeah. So is it a fool's errand? Um... I mean, I, I ultimately, I think we'll find out with time, right? So uh, I, don't, I don't want to theorize on it too much, but um, maybe you could get my answer from where I live now. <laughs> um, but I, I find it difficult, honestly, to tell people what to do in that sense, or, or because, uh, like I told you earlier, I'm, I, I wasn't, I didn't grow up in the West, so I don't have an, a very close attachment to any specific country. So understand how. I understand that it's easy for me to pick up and leave, right? Um, even where I am now, I can pick up and leave, right? Um, I, I'm not attached. There's good things and, the bad, and there's bad things about that, right? Um, but um, yeah, you've got to really think of, I think history helps here. I think looking at history helps. Um, I think looking at the trajectory helps. 
and the trajectory, like you said, is not good, right? Um, on on the on the flip side, what's where is the trajectory good? You know, even in the Muslim world, um, where is trajectory good? In some countries, um, things are kind of staying kind of the same. I mean, now you know what? That's not even true. Uh, things are things are changing in most most of, of the world, and in most countries, things are getting worse. Um, but maybe what it is it's finding pockets so it's not about picking the country to live in it's about picking the community to live in right so like the like the brother that i interviewed sharif he left medina to go and live in new mexico in the us right and and he has uh, so he's not picked the country you know you can see that like he's not even picked the city because obviously what's the best city you know is the city of the prophet um He's not even picked the city. He's picked the environment and the people. So he's gone over to, he's got a farm in New Mexico. And I said, I even said to him, you know, the Prophet ﷺ, he said that uh, those who stay with the people and they mix with the people and they put up, they're, they're patient with the trials of living with people, uh, that person is better than the one who just kind of runs away. And he said, well, I'm not running away. He's like, I'm living amongst people here, right? But the, the non-Muslims I'm around, they're much more kind of conservative. They're farmers. They're simple people, good people. And I'm actually trying my best to bring Muslim families over to live near me so we can have our community out here, right? And interestingly, he said, in Ramadan, when everyone was like uh, doing lockdown and no tarawih and this and that, he said, we're doing tarawih and we're having iftar together because we're in an isolated area where it's funny, like there's no control. Whereas in uh, Egypt or whatever, people are cancelling tarawih. But over there in, the, in a rural setup, uh, people weren't actually controlling what they can and can't do when it comes to like gathering and stuff. So uh, th I think that's interesting to think about. And maybe that's so maybe uh, another example, like maybe the west of Algeria is better. There's a better community there than in the east of Algeria. So within countries, you're going to find different areas. Um, uh, but it's difficult to see how uh, there will be a place that you can just decide on for a multi-generation, multi-generational kind of uh, settlement where you're like, okay, I'm here for the next 10 generations. I think um, a lot of changes are going to happen. And so maybe it's about just thinking two or three generations ahead. Uh, where is a place that uh, things are maybe getting a little bit better or they're not going downhill as much? And where is a place where there's already a good community where I don't have to do all the parenting? Like, there's nothing wrong with parenting. Like, parenting is important and good. But what I mean is that you need the, uh, a community around you to raise your children, not just you, right? They don't need, they, like, they might see uh, you being a good uh, role model as a man or whatever, how to be a good husband or a good uh, father or a good sibling. But then if all the other, you know, uncles in the community are not like that, uh, that's not going to work, right? So. How can you find um, circles of people? And it might just be a, a group of 10 families um, where you feel like, yeah, in these 10 families, uh, you know, eight out of 10 of these men, I'm happy for my son to learn how to be a man from these people, right? Uh, and it's, you know, 10 families is, seems more achievable when you say it like that, right? I, I think it's profound what you're saying. You know, we need to design our lives and we need to design our environment and our community mm. And not just sort of, you know, leave it to fate, right? And leave it to uh, the sort of the natural consequences mm. of things. And I, I, I think you're you're absolutely right. You know, you can find communities in London where yeah. you know mm. you yeah. have a, an amazing relationship with the masjid and uh, and with the community, and and there's a lot going on. And Tarbiya is is you know they have good Islamic schools and. Uh, and and Islamic uh, seminaries and and there's a lot going on, right? And then, as you said, you, you can move five miles away, and none of that is available. Um, Obviously, so, on uh, a on a general picture, it's better to do that in a Muslim country, probably, um, especially more conservative or traditional Muslim countries. Again, the culture is just set where people have these general Islamic etiquettes. Um, I mean, again, that's where traveling comes in. It's like. Uh, I always refer to Algeria because I know Algeria. If you go to Algeria, you find people who, you know, they don't know many sorters. They've never studied beyond just, you know, the basics in school because they do still study like fiqh and stuff in school. Beyond that, they've never studied Islam. They never attended any lecture. Um, maybe even, you know, they don't have the outward appearance of someone who's religious. But 
their values are actually very Islamic. Their manners, you know, they generally understand. Like, like in Algeria, for example, uh, sometimes you might, instead of saying please, you actually make dua for the person, right? These things are ingrained, you know. And so I think there's a lot to, to benefit from that in terms of living in a Muslim uh, country, Muslim majority country. Jazakallah khair. That's really interesting. So when can we uh, get a chance to read your book? When, when do you think you, the book will be published? So in Ramadan, Ramadan was uh, May, wasn't it? So what I said is, inshallah, be done within six months of Ramadan. So I guess we got a few months to go. Um, the, 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 the draft is, is pretty much done, but as you probably would, uh, I don't know if you've written books yourself, but... Um, it's a long uh, process. Yeah. yeah, it's a long process between like the draft and the final thing. So uh, maybe I'm naive, uh, Jalal. Maybe uh, <laughs> it's going to take longer, but inshallah not. Inshallah. Um, so uh, I guess where people could... Uh, find out about it yes. when it is uh, ready is uh, uh, so I will be I'll definitely would have mentioned it on my YouTube channel that's like maybe where I'm the most um, active mm -hmm. so YouTube channel is, is Sera Masters um, S double -E E-R-A Masters yeah um, Sera Masters that's my YouTube channel that's also where I put the video version of the podcast so those two things are found there and I guess if you subscribe there then that's the best place to find me um. Well, Jazakallah Khair Amin for joining us today and uh, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, give you uh, the best in your endeavours inshallah and, and allow us to gain from your research and your knowledge and, and help the Muslim and the Muslim community uh, for, for, for many years to come inshallah ta'ala. Amin Ya Rab and, and same for you. May Allah put baraka in your uh, in the project, uh, the, the Thinking Muslim and allow us to be uh, thinking Muslims, properly thinking Muslims. And uh, yeah, just keep it up, inshallah. And uh, I think we just got to, uh, like, this is really what you're doing is, is an example of, of leadership and uh, taking responsibility. You know, nobody told you you have to do this, I'm sure. You, you chose to do it because you understand that um, it's not enough to sit back and watch things crumble. You know, uh, that would be regretful. So, uh, so, you know, may Allah put barak in the endeavor of, of taking on that leadership. Amin, Amin, inshallah. And now I can say to my nephews and nieces that I've spoken to Amin from Mind Heist <laughs> and uh, <laughs> conducted a, a podcast. So, so maybe they'll start listening to a podcast now, inshallah. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, inshallah. Much, uh, many good guests on it, mashallah. Inshallah. As-salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaykum wa rahmatullah.